Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Learning Biology with Dr. Vanessa, where we take difficult biological concepts and make them easy to understand. Every day, your kidneys filter around 50 gallons of blood, yet you only produce about one to two quarts of urine. Even if your fluid intake varies, your kidneys keep working to maintain stable fluid levels in your body. But have you ever wondered why your urine is sometimes light and clear, while other times it's dark and concentrated? Your kidneys play a vital role in regulating water balance, ensuring that you conserve water when dehydrated and eliminate excess fluid when you're well hydrated. This ability to adjust urine concentration is essential for survival. But how does this happen? What mechanisms actually determine whether your urine is dilute or concentrated? Today, we're gonna take a closer look at how urine becomes either dilute or concentrated, uncovering how the nephron fine tunes water and solute levels to keep the body in balance. Let's first talk about the formation of dilute urine. When the body has excess water, the kidneys produce dilute urine to remove that excess water while preserving essential solutes. This happens through three main steps in the nephron. The first is filtrate formation in the glomerulus. This process begins at the glomerulus where filtration occurs just like in normal urine production. The fluid is going to move from the um, glomerulus into Bowman's capsule, and the filtrate at this stage has a similar osmolarity to blood plasma, about 300 milliosmoles per liter. As the filtrate moves through the proximal convoluted tubule, this will also be just like in normal urine production, and since solutes are going to be reabsorbed and water is going to follow here at the end of the proximal convoluted tubule, we will still have a similar osmolarity, about 300 milliosmoles per liter. Then we move into the nephron loop where we're going to have selective reabsorption. In the descending limb of the nephron loop, water is going to be reabsorbed due to the permeability of water in the descending limb of the loop of Henle. This makes that filtrate more concentrated as it moves down the loop and it increases the osmolarity of the filtrate. Then the filtrate is going to move into the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, and as it does so, sodium, chloride, and potassium are actively reabsorbed, but water cannot follow because at this point, the ascending limb of the loop of Henle is impermeable to water. The result is that the filtrate is going to become more dilute, decreasing the osmolarity of the fluid to about 100 milliosmoles per liter, by the time it reaches the distal convoluted tubule. And then we have the final adjustments in the um, distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. And in the absence of antidiuretic hormone, the late distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct both remain impermeable to water, keeping water in the filtrate, but allowing even more dilution as sodium and chloride can be reabsorbed into the bloodstream without water following. So the result is that there are going to be large amounts of dilute urine, and that urine is going to be about 50 to 100 milliosmoles per liter. And this is ideal when the body has excess water to expel. By the time the fluid reaches the renal pelvis, its concentration can be as low as 50 to 70 milliosmoles per liter, making it four times more dilute than blood plasma or glomerular filtrate. So in this way, the body is able to get rid of that excess water while keeping the solutes in um, that it needs to maintain uh, the balance of fluid and solutes within the body. Let's now move to the formation of concentrated urine. What happens when water intake is low or you're losing water rapidly, like during dehydration or heavy sweating from exercise? In these situations, your kidneys must conserve water to maintain homeostasis while still eliminating wastes and excess ions. 
To do this, they produce a small volume of highly concentrated urine, sometimes reaching up to 1,200 milliosmoles per liter. That's up to four times more concentrated than blood plasma or glomerular filtrate. The key players in this process, they are ADH, antidiuretic hormone, the medullary osmotic gradient, and the countercurrent mechanisms. Let's talk about how these all play a role in making concentrated urine. The role of the medullary osmotic gradient. The interstitial fluid of the renal medulla, so that fluid that is going to be surrounding the nephrons themselves, has an osmotic gradient of solutes that increases from the cortex, where it's about 300 milliosmoles per liter, to the inner medulla, where it gets as high as 1,200 milliosmoles per liter. The three main solutes that contribute to this high osmolarity in the interstitial fluid are sodium, chloride, and urea. This gradient is created by the countercurrent multiplier that we find in the loop of Henle and the countercurrent exchanger that is in the vasa recta, that blood supply that is supplying the loop of Henle. This gradient is critical for water reabsorption in the presence of antidiuretic hormone. Countercurrent multiplication is a process in the loop of Henle that helps create a concentration gradient in the interstitial fluid of the renal medulla. This allows for water reabsorption and the production of concentrated urine when needed. This process primarily occurs in the juxtamedullary nephrons. These are those nephrons that have long loops of Henle that extend deep into the medulla. These loops are essential for creating the osmotic gradient that is needed for countercurrent multiplication. In contrast, we also had talked about cortical nephrons in a past video. They have short loops of Henle that barely reach the medulla, so they play little to no role in this process. So as we talk about this process, we are really referring to the juxtamedullary nephrons that have very long loops of Henle extending deep into the medulla. By utilizing countercurrent flow between the descending and ascending limbs of the loop of Henle, the nephron loop is going to act as a countercurrent multiplier, creating the medullary osmotic gradient. The kidneys then use this gradient to regulate water reabsorption and urine concentration as needed. The production of concentrated urine includes the following, sodium, potassium, chloride symporters in the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle actively reabsorb sodium and chloride from the filtrate into the medullary interstitial fluid. Because this segment is impermeable to water, sodium and chloride ions accumulate in the medulla, in the interstitial fluid of the medulla, reinforcing the osmotic gradient. Countercurrent flow plays a key role in maintaining this gradient. The descending limb of the loop of Henle is permeable to water but impermeable to solutes, so water moves out of the filtrate by osmosis into the increasingly concentrated interstitial fluid of the renal medulla. As a result, the filtrate becomes progressively more concentrated as it moves down the loop of Henle. The ascending limb, in contrast, is impermeable to water, but actively transports sodium and chloride out. As solutes leave, but water remains, then the filtrate within the loop of Henle is going to become progressively more dilute as it moves upward. This opposite flow in the two limbs, countercurrent flow, establishes an osmotic gradient in the renal medulla that ranges from 300 milliosmoles per liter in the outer cortex to 1200 milliosmoles per liter in the deepest part of the medulla. The deeper into the medulla, the more hyperosmotic the environment becomes, helping to pull water out of the collecting duct when ADH is present. This concentrates the urine even further. When antidiuretic hormone is present, which is triggered by dehydration or low water intake in the body, it acts on principal cells in the collecting duct, increasing their permeability to water. 
Antidiuretic hormone does this by inserting aquaporin-2 channels into the collecting duct membrane, which increases water reabsorption, allowing the filtrate to equilibrate with the hyperosmotic medulla. Urea recycling also plays a role in concentrating urine. Urea is constantly transferred between different segments of the renal tubule and the interstitial fluid, leading to a buildup of urea in the medulla. This further enforces the osmotic gradient, promoting water reabsorption and ensuring that a small volume of highly concentrated urine is excreted. And you need to understand that as we increase the osmolarity within the interstitial fluid of the medulla, this is going to help to pull water out of the nephron um, because we have to move, when we reabsorb, we have to move that water from the interstitial fluid and then into the blood supply that is there. So those are the steps it needs to take. So as we increase the concentration or the osmolarity within the interstitial fluid, this is going to um, help promote that water reabsorption out of the nephron and into the interstitial fluid. Now, countercurrent exchange is a passive process where solutes and water are exchanged now between the interstitial fluid of the renal medulla and the blood of the vasa recta. So the next part of um, the story that I was telling you, okay? So this is also going to happen in those long loops of Henle in the juxtamedullary nephrons. And these nephrons have that blood supply of the peritubular capillaries and then the vasa recta. And the vasa recta also has very long descending and ascending limbs that lie parallel to those of the loop of Henle. So how does this counter current exchange work? First, we're going to have the descending limb of the vasa recta. Here, blood is going to flow deep into the renal medulla where the interstitial fluid is increasingly hyperosmotic. Again, that interstitial fluid is going from 300 milliosmoles per liter in the cortex to 1200 milliosmoles per liter in the deepest medulla. Water is going to diffuse out of the blood into the surrounding interstitial fluid due to that osmotic gradient. At the same time, sodium, chloride, and urea are going to passively diffuse into the blood, increasing its osmolarity as it moves deeper into the medulla. And then we have the ascending limb of the vasa recta. As blood ascends towards the cortex, it enters a less concentrated environment. Water re-enters the blood from the interstitial fluid while sodium and chloride diffuse out. This makes sure that the osmolarity of blood leaving the vasa recta is about 320 milliosmoles per liter, making it only slightly higher than the osmolarity of blood that entered the vasa recta, which was about 300 milliosmoles per liter. In this way, the vasa recta can supply oxygen and nutrients to the cells of the renal medulla without washing out the osmotic gradient. The osmotic gradient is established by the long loops of Henle in the renal medulla through countercurrent multiplication, but the vasa recta maintains the osmotic gradient in the renal medulla by countercurrent exchange. So in a nutshell, what determines whether your kidneys produce dilute or concentrated urine? Dilute urine is formed when antidiuretic hormone levels are low, keeping the collecting ducts impermeable to water leading to a high volume, low osmolarity output. Concentrated urine is produced when antidiuretic hormone levels are high, increasing water reabsorption and allowing urine to reach maximum concentration. The medullary osmotic gradient and countercurrent mechanisms are essential for creating the conditions necessary for water conservation when needed. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, share and subscribe so that you never miss out on new content. Thank you.